Hello, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to come and talk about our project. I'm Karen Cariani, Executive Director of the WGBH Media Library and Archive in Boston. Um, I'm going to talk, though, about the American Archive Collection today. Um, and that is a collaboration that WGBH has with the Library of Congress, and, and also about our work with Brandeis University. Uh, so the material in the AAPB collection comes from over 100 sources around the country dating back to the 1940s to the present. <coughs> Excuse me. It has great variety, and that is really a key point. Um, the content of the collection varies from a single speaker, like a news announcer at a desk with a single microphone, to a man on the street with a heavy accent and a background noise, to music, to foreign language, and potentially all these things mixed into one program. It comes from all regions across the country, people in speaking in different accents, dialects, speech patterns, and speed of talking. And I can't seem to be able to talk very fast. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the metadata is also variable, often coming from local public media stations with no archivists or librarians on staff. Much of the content has limited uh, descriptions. And the AAPB is growing annually, with each new collection and thousands of files being added, increasing the problem. So our first venture into machine learning was to extensively use speech-to-text tool, Caldi, to create transcripts that we thought would increase discoverability and providing by providing text for search engines to scan and index. It took six to eight months to process transcripts for 68,000 items. The quality of the transcripts varied. <clears throat> the accuracy of the programs from a single source, single speaker, formal announcer, somebody behind a desk with a microphone in front of their face, was about 95% accurate. That's pretty good. No accents, one speaker. But we have lots of variety, as I mentioned, and it was only 55% accurate for a television program from Mississippi with a very strong southern U.S. accent. The biggest mistakes are with proper nouns and names. So we did index the uncorrected transcripts in April of 2017. And as you can see, there was an overall general increase in users coming to the site. The search engines were driving traffic to the site. So those keyword indexing did work to some extent. The transcripts did enhance the discoverability, and even, even with inaccurate transcripts. Um, the question is whether the users were actually finding what they were looking for. Um, so granted, a commercial service such as Amazon Speech-to-Text may be a bit more accurate than our uh, tests with Caldi. Um, it's, with this kind of volume, it gets really expensive. And with the kind of variety that we have, it's actually not that much more accurate. For example, Amazon Web Services facial recognition is probably not going to recognize Jim Lehrer or Robert McNeil, who is in the middle there. Um, in fact, it's probably not going to recognize any of these people. Um, and personally, I would rather see better tools in the open source uh, space that are easy and affordable for cultural heritage institutions to use. So as we were working on these projects, we realized that each attribute that you want data for needs a separate tool to extract the data. The natural language processing tools does one specific thing. It identifies a location, it identifies proper nouns, etc. But you need to characterize what the thing is first to know which tool to use. And for each characterization, you need another tool. So what we really need is a workflow that can automatic, whoops, automatically plug in the appropriate tool for the appropriate attribute once the file has been characterized. And if we can pipeline the tools, then the output of one tool gives a refined input for the next. And I just want to point out that we may have all these attributes up here on the screen and characterizations in one video file across many shots and many frames. And that's the challenge of time-based media. So in order for these tools for complicated collections, you have to adapt and train them. So how are archivists going to do that? Um, we've already begun to work directly with CL experts at Brandeis University, James Pustyovsky's group, which you'll hear from, to see if we can solve some of our challenges. Um, we have a Mellon-funded grant to work on the collaboration, and we've identified some key specific attributes that they can work on, such as forced alignment of transcripts. We often have clean transcripts with no timestamps, timestamping bars and tones at the beginning to improve the user experience, identifying music, foreign languages, identifying text on the screen, and OCR to use that as data. So the data set focus is the NewsHour collection, 30 years of NewsHour programs. We're starting with some obvious success, key data that we need that's verifiable. Program slates that can verify title, the date it aired, the producer, the lower thirds, identifying people on the screen, credit at the end giving us production staff, participants, and of course, copyright info. We can then hopefully take that output and use it as metadata. 
And if possible, they can also use the speaker ID, verify it against perhaps an, an announcer introducing the speaker, and then even use facial recognition to find that person again somewhere in the same video file. We're hoping to move towards a program type identification. For example, there's a single person at a desk, therefore this might be a news broadcast. So we started talking what we needed as archivists and if the Brandeis team could help us. And uh, would the work be interesting enough for them as computational linguists in a research environment? And what challenges do we have that would be interesting for them to solve? So James is going to talk about the work. So my name is James Pustyowski from Brandeis, and I'm representing our group, the Lang Laboratory for Language and Linguistics and Computation. And uh, here with me are Kelly Lynch and uh, Kay Rim, two of my PhD students who are working on this project. So we were approached by WGBH and asked if we could help apply AI and CL tools to the task of creating metadata so that archivists and mutatis mutandi librarians and other people would have more discoverability capabilities for what are actually in their assets. And to me, it actually turned out to be something more than just an application, but was actually a research project. Uh, a couple things to note, within audiovisual data, the task of actually analyzing the data are already uniquely more complex than just text, something that we had been uh, very familiar with. You have time-based media, obviously, both audio and video. They're eh, aligned. They're analyzed. They, you have text in video. You have, uh, they're subject to linguistic analysis. So you have, obviously, the transcriptions of the audio to text data, which then, of course, becomes pipelined into uh, NER and other NL tools. But video have uh, embedded text, as we all know, not only Chiron and, and lower thirds, but logos, t-shirts, uh, and things like that. So linguistic and image and da data alignment was necessary in order to do this. Not, in, not to mention things which are more part of the provenance of Google and uh, Microsoft and uh, Apple, such as uh, object and face recognition. So we have been developing CLAMS, which is computational linguistic application uh, for uh, applications for multimedia services, allowing an archivist to create a new or access an existing workflow by dragging and dropping from a tool shed of registered tools of speech, text, and vision applications available in an open source fashion. Enabling, cleaning up, removing uh, unwanted uh, scenes and uh, entire segments, intervals of uh, a video, identifying text within video, indexing for search and then for discoverability through visualization techniques such as Banana and Kibana. And then, obviously, the core of language technology, such as named entity recognition, annotation, semantic annotation, sentiment analysis, and things like that. In addition to that, we are moving towards doing language type analysis by um, outputting to an API for the Google language identification, categorizing scene types to do chaptering, as well as, uh, as, well as other tools. So it's a, wolf, it's a tool shed workflow that it would be usable by the archivist. You would download it as a Docker, and we'll, we're gonna have a tutorial on this uh, tomorrow afternoon. You have tools coming from a language application grid called LAPS, which is a tutorial tomorrow morning at 10 that we'll have. Just These are text-based tools. And they get integrated into a CLAMS tool shed, which are a video and audio tools integrating into essentially your own workflow of analysis of what do you need done to a specific data set or a specific asset. So you're an archivist or a librarian, you have tools, you wanna to be able to improve your metadata search, creating new metadata, and how do you do that? So <clears throat> the way to do this, you, you basically have something like a uh, noodling drag and drop workflow editor to create pipelines from uh, something we borrow from Galaxy, where you've got a, a arrangement of tools available to you you basically plug them in. I want to use something like a, uh, bars and tone identification to filter them. I want to find out what's on a slate, or what's in this Chiron, or what are these bottom thirds doing, or I want to do a forced alignment of this very nicely done transcript of Lehrer, but I've got a video and they're not aligned. So I want to use something like the Montreal or the Gentle 
uh, deep learning forced alignment for there. So you plug those in and have that done. So the idea is it's an open source app development environment, and we'll talk about that. It all is based on something we call MMIF, which is a multimedia interchange format, which allows in a JSON-LD wrapped form, you to, to put something into the work shed. Basically, it will play nice with everyone else in the toolkit, and it, it basically provides an interchangeability language, both syntactically and semantically. Everything is type compliant, and it will uh, play with something that is also type compliant. It has a syntax and a semantics that we're going to go over tomorrow in the tutorial. There are three basic anchor types. One is character-based, one is region, and the other one is time-based annotation. And these, of course, can be aligned. So character-based would be something that's coming from a transcript. So when Sebastian Thrun started working on self-driving cars at Google in 2007, blah, 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 blah. I've got a, a wrapped structure, which is this JSON-LD wrapped MIF and I have these things basically annotated as a certain metadata typing. This is a, a, a character-based anchoring. Here I, I have a bounding box polygon uh, uh, annotation, so, and that's essentially going to the actual coordinate structure, how that's mapped, annotated according to that. And this is gonna be an interval-based, which is gonna be a video along with the frame rate and the frame interval structure. And these would be linkable one to the other so that you could annotate an annotation of the transcript to something on the video. So basically the way this is gonna work, you have something like a slate here, we translate it, put it into metadata, which would be PB core, Dublin core, something like that, as well as parsing the bottom third and then uh, something like rolling credits. So currently, we do junk frame, bars and tones filtering, slate detection and parsing, Chiron rolling credit recognition and parsing, forced alignment, as I mentioned. We have some initial results on chaptering. Uh, we're working towards multimodal entity co-reference. And then this is all going to basically give rise to this, outputting it into a separate visualization tool, such as Kibana, where it's elastic search indexed, and then allowing for full NER and parsing over transcripts. The whole point is to give rise to a better discoverability environment for our friends, the archivists and librarians. Thank you. And now I would like to introduce a um, dear friend and, and partner now of some time um, in this effort of the conference and also one of the co-conference uh, program committee members, uh, Svenarna Brigbill. Well, thank you. Thank you, Nicole, and uh, thank you uh, to the rest of the organizers of, uh, of this conference. Uh, it's fantastic to be here. Uh, we did this uh, last year in, uh, in Oslo. Uh, we had some sort of a festival around uh, what we um, called uh, Fantastiske Fremtider, eller, or uh, Fantastic Futures. We hope this will be um, uh, not um, the last one, but uh, one of the first ones. Um, as Auslök mentioned, uh, we are into the boring part of AI nowadays, uh, and I'm going to talk you through um, uh, the boring parts of what we do in, at the National Library of Norway and why. <clears throat> uh, but first of all, about the National Library of Norway, we are, uh, as national libraries uh, tend to be, a main memory institution in our nation. Uh, we take care of uh, more or less all the information uh, uh, the uh, citizen uh, has, has access to, and we preserve it uh, for eternity. We have one location in Oslo and one where uh, I live up north. Um, Fifteen years ago, approximately, uh, we made this ambition of uh, um, digitizing everything because we believe um, people expect um, information to be digitally available uh, where they are. And the status um, today is that we have digitized more or less all the books published in, in Norway um, from the beginning until now. We have dig digitized uh, quite a, a lot of, of newspapers. We have a large uh, radio collection and uh, photographs and more. <clears throat> and uh, this leads, of course, uh, to AI. 
uh, one of the things that uh, makes uh, AI possible today is uh, the content. We have content and we have uh, uh, metadata. Uh, together with the democrat democratized software, uh, the hardware, uh, and also the general understanding. I am a great uh, advocate for elements of AI. Uh, go and see it, uh, learn from the Finns. And this fits very well into uh, the, uh, the thinking of uh, being a library, where we have lots of data which we want to structure into information. And what we aim at now, and uh, Auslock point, pointed at uh, that as well, we want to make knowledge. We want, want people to, to have better access to, to knowledge and eventually uh, be more wise, eventually. So we have established um, um, our laboratory <clears throat> uh, with a few persons working only on AI in libraries, archives and museums. Um, we run small-scale uh, experiments, like a few days up to a few months, um, and they are more or less defined by uh, the, um, the rest of the library or other communities. Um, we name it after uh, Nancy, the uh, Nancy Pearl action figure, <coughs> which was the only thing I brought back from uh, a journey to uh, uh, Michigan to look at the Google uh, digitization project in 2005. I got to see a building uh, and a doll. Um, but today we are into uh, uh, AI and we have established based on the, what we have digitized and what we have got uh, uh, born digitally, sort of a learning pl platform. Um, and uh, to answer Brian uh, Catanzaro, this is a thing that we want to make uh, accessible also for the industry, uh, so that companies can come to us and uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, do their training of their models and take uh, the models out and uh, and apply them. We uh, use TensorFlow. We try not to uh, invest very much in studying the te technology. We have just chosen one platform. And it seems <clears throat> like it's um, a, a good choice. Um, some of you joined a course yesterday, uh, which is a typical thing we do uh, from our laboratory. We go out and, and give courses on, for example, TensorFlow or machine learning. We also make uh, pretty heavy use of commercial API services on the net um, to be effective and also to study uh, if they are applicable uh, within our, uh, the library. We mostly use, uh, again, Google. Uh, and uh, this is a good illustration of uh, um, our understanding of uh, the inside of machine learning. <laughs> it is very precise, in fact. Uh, but we try to um, teach people around us a little about machine learning and introduce them to the circle of uh, learning. Uh, we try to teach people to talk about uh, good enough and not good enough <coughs> and uh, going to uh, the use of, uh, of applications. What we typically do then um, is to run small projects on, for example, text, on photos, on audio, on video, more or less everything. And uh, <clears throat> again, small projects, proof of concepts, uh, experiments to, to demonstrate, to inspire and to provoke. <clears throat> I'll skip a few um, um, slides. Um, I promised my friends here at Stanford to show them uh, a picture of my puppy. <laughs> uh, 
and it is a uh, apropos learning. Um, my puppy is the, the one to uh, to the right. The one to the left is is also a puppy. They are friends. Um, this is the Norwegian uh, way of being friends. Uh, but what struck me uh, looking at this dog the other day was uh, that um, you are really doing slow learning. Uh, this dog learned. Uh, within the, the fraction of a second, uh, not to be too close to the cat. <laughs> right, it was just one hit with a claw. Um, so we have a way to go um, in terms of learning, at least learning fast. <clears throat> I'll walk you quickly through one of the uh, large experiments that we have done, demos, uh, to illustrate uh, uh, what might be possible uh, and what we think is possible. And the experiment is to, to make a complete digital library without human intervention, without cataloging, uh, with less human effort. We chose the content, all the newspapers from one month in uh, uh, 2011, uh, two radio channels and also one television channel in, in Norway. We wanted to, uh, to identify uh, persons, places, organizations. Uh, we wanted to some extent also uh, uh, to, to understand the content. We wanted to build relations between uh, the entities that we extracted. And uh, uh, to make it, um, this a little fast, this is the principle for how we built the, uh, uh, the system. <clears throat> we made uh, heavily use of uh, Google's uh, APIs, uh, their machine learning based uh, um, services, and we tried to make text out of more or less everything. And then we uh, did the entity extraction, uh, put everything into a search in, uh, index, Elastic, and we combined it with uh, information from the internet with respect to geolocations. Uh, and the result is more or less like this. Uh, we uh, were able to, to place the information, uh, do geo-based search uh, in, in Elastic. Uh, we can zoom into the map. <coughs> to the left we have um, uh, organizations, persons, uh, and, uh, 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 and places. In this case I've done a, a, a a text search for our uh, prime minister at the time being, um, and the bars to the left indicates the, the strength of the relation between uh, Jens Stoltenberg and organizations, places, and uh, persons. In this demo, I um, choose one of the newspaper uh, pages and um, um, based on the relation between uh, Jens Stoltenberg and uh, Maria Amelie, a person. And if we go uh, uh, directly into uh, this, uh, this newspaper page, uh, we can easily see that uh, there uh, is some kind of relation between those two. And <clears throat> remember, everything is done without uh, human intervention. Um, so, um, I'm running uh, slightly out of time, uh, but I would say what we really have learned is that doing experiments on AI is simple, it's cheap, uh, um, it can be done in small scale and uh, demonstra demonstrate in, in large scale. Um, and. Um, I think the most valuable um, um, experience so far is in fact that uh, moving further is very difficult. We can do more or less everything of what we do uh, with uh, human resources today, but going into production, um, making this system real, this system re systems real is very, very difficult. Um, and, um, and 
we talk about this uh, oval, the red circle, um, the implications of uh, going into, into production. Um, and we have no explanation uh, of uh, how, why it is so difficult. Uh, uh, it's worth um, spending some time on, on that um, uh, on that era uh, later tomorrow and, and uh, on Friday. Um, I'll skip a few more. <coughs> Brian Cantancero um, um, uh, also uh, was into the um, development of, of the technology. This is uh, showing the um, performance uh, of uh, image classification from 2011 to 2010. You can see the error rate it goes down to to uh, three percent from 26, and the average for a human being is five percent. Still, we don't, we don't accept uh, this as as good enough. Um, another challenge is that we um, go into eras which are um, hard to explain, like similarity. Uh, several speakers today have been into, into uh, um, similarity, <coughs> and we have done some work uh, and going fast again. Um, for photograph, it is obvious, it's easy to see that uh, uh, these are uh, images of horses, uh, except uh, maybe one to the left down there. Um, a strange source, but for books it is more difficult. This is, even though it is encrypted in, in uh, uh, Norwegian, you can see uh, uh, by the titles that they seem to be um, related. Uh, but we, when we put this into um, service, as a recommendation service, for example, um, does it make sense? Uh, are the recommendations correct? Are they good enough? Um, how do we measure the, the um, effect of what we um, uh, show the users? Um, <clears throat> so the main conclusions now is that we are just in the beginning of a long, long journey. Uh, we need to put um, the technology into production. Uh, we need collaboration. Um, and this is really a good era for, for collaboration. Since it is so easy to share uh, both um, training sets, uh, but also uh, trained uh, models. Uh, and as, as Oslak said, it's time to look further. We, try to, we, we have to try to, to start to understand what, what comes next. The, yeah, for example, the understanding of content. Right. Um, we are here, the three of us in, the, in this laboratory, but also people from the Language Bank of, uh, of the National, National Library, uh, which also, who also work pretty much on, on AI, on language. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. I'm very grateful to be here today. So um, I wanted to present a new service that we're going to open next year and that we call the BNF uh, Data Lab. So um, from, from the BNF point of view, we are in the National Library, Heritage Library, so we have uh, challenges that are pretty similar to, to what uh, Sven Arne just uh, introduced. And we've uh, entered the, um, the dig digital era a long time ago. Uh, you may know our digital library, Gallica, which, was, uh, uh, which celebrated its 20th birthday uh, last year. So um, it has now 5 million digiti digitized uh, items from, from the BNF and other French uh, libraries. We're also building a quite uh, important uh, web archive. And um, what happened is that uh, we've put a lot of effort at the beginning in creating user interfaces that were 
similar to what people used to have when they were uh, consulting analog documents. So building the, the digital library, Gallica, a lot, a lot of our efforts during many years uh, has gone towards having nice viewers, uh, high quality digitization, but also uh, zooming facilities and things like that that would make it possible to work on, on the digital document just as if you had the physical documents in hand. And more or less the same happened with uh, web archives when we started collecting the web. Uh, the first uh, interfaces that we are using to display the web content to the, the archived web content to the users um, was the, 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 um, the Wayback Machine, which is uh, an interface that tries to replay um, the, web, uh, the archived web um, in a way that is as similar as possible to what it used to be when we collected it. And a few years ago, we started having people asking us uh, to use the collections, the digital collections, differently, uh, to use them as if they were a, a, a bunch of data. And they wanted to have their hands on this raw data and not on the interfaces, the user interfaces that we had created for them. So uh, this, um, yeah, this... Uh, this new need from our users uh, led to uh, four, year, four years a research project that we called Corpus and that, that we are ending right now. And the data lab is what's coming next. So I, I, I thought that instead of going through the whole Corpus um, initiative, it would be nice to, I have a, such a short amount of time, it would be nice to try to have an overview of uh, the results of this initiative and what we think uh, users need when it comes to using digital collections uh, as data and to use uh, these uh, uh, computational environments, uh, machine learnings and artificial intelligence to, 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 to use the digital collections. So we conducted a bunch of experiments with the, these user uh, and um, and also uh, carried out actual projects uh, to try to analyze what they what they needed. And so what we are building is uh, the BNF Data Lab. It's a physical space, and that's uh, one of the first things that is uh, maybe a bit surprising about uh, about the project is that um, when you go to researchers and ask them what kind of um, what kind of services they would like their first uh, thought is that they don't need to come physically to the library because the di collections are digital so in principle they should have access remotely uh, in their labs or in their whatever facility they want to use but what happens is that part of these collections are under copyright so we are not allowed to give them out uh, even to identified researchers and also um, conducting this study we discovered that uh, uh, the researchers who are working in this area are, are actually eager for, for space, uh, uh, like, you know, just uh, square meters where they can sit and stay and stay for a long time. Uh, so this is one of the things that we are, we are offering. And um, then there are a bunch of services. And there is also a website that was created for the hackathon that we held in 2017. So you have the, the address of the website here. It's api.bnf.e4. And there's really, uh, and sorry, it's only in French for, for the moment, but translation is definitely on our agenda. So there's really nothing really new about this website, except that we are bundling in one place uh, all the computational ways to access the BNF data, be it uh, data from the catalogs, uh, OAI PMH repositories uh, that allow you to crawl things, uh, but also, um, CSV file that we may have, and uh, IIIF API, uh, all, the, all the different means of accessing uh, the different kinds of data um, in a computational way. Another thing that's, in, that's interesting in, in there is that uh, we are bundling together the different kinds of digital collections. Of course, we cannot uh, give access to copyrighted work and especially uh, the uh, legal deposit works, so the web archives are not available on this website, but you have lists of seeds, so lists of URLs that, you are, that we are calling, 
and uh, this website provides access to um, the metadata through protocols like SRU uh, or uh, semantic web uh, interfaces like data BNF that some of you may, may know about, so the linked data uh, stuff and also the digital library. So the idea is that when you're starting using the collections as data, you're using all these. Uh, and of course, if you're working on digital objects, you also need the metadata. So it's useful to have all this in, in one place. So then going back to my diagram, what you see in the red part in the middle is a description of the services that we've been thinking about. And then on the left, you have uh, the organization that the BNF already has and how it fits with these services. And on the right, uh, just to mention that we are working with uh, the CNRS, which, which is the Institute for Research in France, uh, to build a partnership, uh, especially to have a scientific advisory to our, to our project and to be able to conduct a call for projects and to inject funding uh, in, in the data lab. But today I would like to focus more on the center part and the left part. And I think what's really important and, and what's really yeah, interesting about our project is that um, we didn't reinvent the wheel. We tried, uh, and, and especially we, we don't create um, a new service with a de dedicated team for the data lab, but we tried to fit in the things that the BNF already is doing for, for, his, for uh, their users um, to fit in this new activity. And uh, so we developed a bunch of services, so starting from the top, um, the pet paid services are built on top of the on-demand digitization, which is something that we've been doing uh, for several years. So we have an image, uh, images department who takes orders from uh, patrons who want to have reproduction of a single uh, document. And they started doing this uh, uh, in mass. So it's something that they didn't do before. And now we have to address people who are asking not to digitize one page or one document, but I don't know, 100,000 pages, for instance. So we have to fit that in our process. We also have um, extraction uh, requests, uh, things like, okay, you already have digitized that, but can you OCR it for, for us? Um, or can you uh, just extract the raw data so that we, can, we don't have to do it ourselves, we can just put it in our machines? Uh, and we also plan to have uh, data processing uh, things, so transform one format into another format or providing access to an IT uh, infrastructure when they want to work on, um, especially on copyrighted work that may not uh, leave the premises of the library. We need to provide also um, workspace, like some kind of cloud, so that they can uh, work in that, in that environment. So the second block in the red uh, part of the diagram is reference and orientation. And that's also an interesting choice that we've uh, made. Um, it's that uh, we um, have decided that the reference librarians in the libraries are going to be transformed into the AI uh, librarians. So it's basically the people who are more, more experts in using the catalogs, uh, although they are maybe more experts in using the paper or the card catalogs, uh, but they are uh, going to be the ones who will be the, the reference for this new service. So the, the location of the data lab is the reading room with, where they are working. And that's also the place where we are going to host uh, projects or people like PhDs or postdocs that are working on these projects. Uh, it's also the place where we are going to have uh, events. So um, I think I'm running out of time, and I don't, I, I won't be able to comment all the blocks of the, of the, of the diagram. But if you're interested, you can come to talk to me, and uh, we also have the workshop tomorrow, and uh, I'll be happy to to comment more. But I think the main idea that I wanted to share with you today is the, this idea of not creating a new team, but rather integrating a new capacity, new skills for supporting this activity, which is an activity to search the collections, even if it's using different ways or different techniques, uh, how we're integrating this uh, in, the, in the life and the skills uh, of the library. Thank you very much. Well, thanks to um, everyone here at Stanford who've organized this event. Um, I'm a native Californian, so it's really cool to be able to come back here and, and show what we're doing in New Haven really exciting. 
Jag säger också tack till de som har kommit hit från Norge och andra nordiska länder. Jag tycker det är alltid väldigt schysst när USA och ett nordiskt land kan samarbeta på det här sättet. Som ett ämne som får in i lärningsprocessen. Det är väldigt kul. I want to talk today about um, collection scale visuals. Collection scale. That was actually an AI. It was the uh, Swedish chef. That, you know. um, what we're really interested in talking about today in 10 minutes is collection scale visualization. And so what we've done at the lab at Yale is we've written some open source software called Pixplot. Um, Pixplot is available on GitHub and it's designed for anyone from a solitary researcher to a curator or a librarian, somebody who works for a state library. Um, or an art museum to be able to do what we call collection scale visualization. And really the impetus for trying to visualize at scale, at the scale of a collection, is the intuition that we are digitizing more and more images every day. We're leaving our users, and I say this as a library employee, we're leaving our users with these amazing online digital catalogs of art and, and photo photography and illustration, for which the only user interface affordance is the ne next button and the previous button. And so we just acquired about 60,000 uh, Civil War photographs at the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library. The only thing I can tell students to do is to go forwards and backwards 60,000 times to look at these. Of course, they could search, but they aren't comprehensively cataloged yet. And if somebody looks for the word horse and the image is actually described as equestrian, that's not going to do them any good. So we have this, these two things coming together. We're scanning more and more, and text is a sort of impoverished way of talking about the richness of visual culture. Now, because this is, a, um, of course, a conference on AI, we are going to talk a little bit about how deep learning is going to help us do collection scale visualization. And the specific thing we're going to talk about is actually a little controversial. We've been hearing today about all the problems with pre-trained networks. And indeed, there are a lot of problems with pre-trained captioning networks. These are the things that we read about in the news that misidentify people or make all sorts of horrible errors or maybe misrecognize something on your own phone. In fact, if you want to try this, it doesn't matter if you have an Android or an iPhone, you can take your own phone out, you can go to your Photos app, you can find the search button and you can just type the word cat. So for me, I have 301 pictures of cats on my phone that I've ever taken a picture of. Of course, I've never labeled these pictures, this isn't Flickr, so what's going on? Well, the answer is a convolutional neural network which is running on your iPhone if you're an Apple user or running in the cloud if you use Google Photos or if you use Android, are running there and are actively captioning what you take pictures of. And you can see, as I have 300 pictures here of cats, this works really well. So why not just take all of the art from Yale's museums, galleries, and libraries and throw it into this? And of course, the answer is, is that the labels that these systems are trained on are inappropriate for the vast majority of things that we have in our museums, galleries, and libraries. They can recognize skateboards, but they can't recognize um, you know, oil paintings from Great Britain. And so what we really want to do is to back up a little bit. And we've heard this intuition from Thomas Schmitz. Um, he referenced, of course, um, Benoit Seguin's paper at DH 2016 in Krakow of using earlier layers in this network. So if we think about our own vision system and our own biological brains, starting with very simple lines and shapes and then advancing through all sorts of other layers towards finally recognizing something like an uncle or a glass of water, so too do artificial vision systems start with very simple observations and then arrive at a set of conclusions based in the case of convolutional networks only on the categories they've been trained on. So if we can take one step back, if we can take one step back to the penultimate layer, the semifinal layer, what we might be able to do is to arrive at a kind of high dimensional space which has solved the featureization problem, um, but which gives us a little bit more abstraction than like cat or dog or bagel or banana. And if we're successful in doing this, as Thomas mentioned, we will end up in about a 2048 dimensional space. And that space has to be reduced intelligently to be visualized in two dimensions, because I myself, um, despite my request to our budget office, um, I do not have a 2048 dimensional screen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you 2048 dimensions reduced down to two dimensions, and that's actually what I'm going to do here. I should say in the DH Lab, a value that we have is that um, we always document what we're doing and that it's very clear um, what kind of algorithms we're putting things through. I'll wait for that screen to catch up with me here in a second. Um, and so what we're going to see here is something that we're explaining, but that I think is also kind of interesting to look at. There. One more time. Let's do that. 
So um, here's our explanation. Um, hopefully this should clarify everything for everybody. Um, and what we're gonna do now is we're gonna look at about 31,000 pictures of Oslo, of the Norwegian capital. Um, and in fact, these were taken from Norwegian cultural institutions. If I scroll in, you can see we have all sorts of pictures here. Um, these actually come from about 1860 to 1924. Um, and there's nothing special about them. They're each um, important in their own way, people skiing and there's portraits and things like that. Um, but this is about 31,000 images displayed in the web browser at the same time. Um, and these are just um, ordered in the order they were ingested. So there's nothing really important about what image is next to what image in this particular uh, visualization. What is interesting is the notion of being able to reorganize this um, set of 31,000 images in real time according to visual similarity. And that's in fact what I've done here. So now as opposed to kind of a dumb grid of pictures, what we have are essentially all of the images which are visually similar to one another landing in the same area. So we have all these cartoons or caricatures here. Um, and again, we're not looking at labels, although I do show you a caption on the bottom left. Um, they're actually not what we look at. What we're interested in is the pixels, not the descriptions. And so we have some curated things here. Here's a collection of men, in particular um, collars, often worn by priests. I should say that um, priest collar is not actually a category in this. We're not, um, what we're basically doing is we're looking for things that are visually similar to each other. And in this case, this category shows um, all the images that are similar to each other, just like all the co commercial and um, important big buildings like banks and government buildings are all here. These are not too far away from some of our historical buildings or more traditional buildings. So these buildings might have more peaked roofs, they might be older, they might be made out of wood. Um, they're in this general area, this semantic field, which sort of goes from um, banks and government buildings up here all the way down to more traditional buildings at the bottom. And um, I can take you through, I think there's a category for skiing over here. Um, we can see people on the ice, people skating and skiing. Um, these are labels I've given them, so I've curated this. I'm not building a training network based on these. I'm basically just taking a cluster of the images um, using k-means clustering. And um, the last thing I wanna show you with this visualization is, it's kind of interesting to look at. Here's 31,000 images on my screen all at one time. I can go around and see. Maybe um, you like uh, cottages in the countryside. Norway, I'm told, has a lot of those. Um, and so it's pretty cool to see all these at once, but of course the problem is I kind of have to flip around and try to see what's behind them. So really, wouldn't it be interesting to be able to reorder these into a grid while keeping the visual similarity still there? And in fact, that's what we do. So in our um, visual visualization of similarity, you might have noticed that we have this really special category here. These are all images that we didn't, I didn't really know what they were. They're all in round things. It's like what kind of weird lens was used. Um, and of course, the answer turns out to be that the, the people who catalog these for the um, museum knew what they were doing. And so they actually, we can jump to that website and we can go there. And as you can read, um, what's going on is there was a person who had like Google Glass uh, in the 1900s. So this was a guy who had a, a hidden camera in his lapel and he took pictures walking down the streets in Oslo and that's why it's, a, it's like essentially like a spy camera. But they're all in this weird um, round thing and that's why this cluster. Now keep your eyes on this cluster. The question is, is it gonna cohere when we use Mario Klingerman's uh, raster ferry algorithm to put all of them in the same spot, but to sort of gridify them in some interesting way. And so you can see that in fact, that's what's happened. We still have the things in the round circles, but they've been turned from a sort of, a sort of projection into this really nice grid. And again, that's about 31,000 objects animating in your web browser there. So let me um, switch back and show you how do we do this? Um, as we mentioned, um, we take a pre-trained convolutional network that anybody can get that is really powerful because it's been designed to solve the ImageNet challenge. We heard that the, the solutions for that challenge are so good, the whole uh, challenge has actually been uh, sort of shut down. We take the semi-final layer with 2048 um, abstract feature vectors. Um, we project those using something very similar to principal component analysis or T-stochastic neighbor embedding, but a little better called UMAP, Uniform Manifolds. Um, and then what's really key is that we pr uh, use a WebGL programming technique to show you those 30,000 images of Oslo in your web browser all at the same time. You can't do that with HTML. You have to treat it as if you were writing a 3D game. And so Doug Duhame, who's here in the uh, uh, room with me today, is our software engineer on PixPlot, the chief architect. Um, it's his skill in um, doing this that has allowed us to um, put this software out for everybody's use. 
Um, anybody who's looked at these types of visualizations, and you can build them on anything, we've built them on pictures through the Library of Congress, um, you can of course see a genealogy, and I do want to acknowledge as I wrap up the importance of the work of Lev Manovich and direct visualization. I also want to acknowledge the importance of the Google Arts and Culture effort out of France, whose Tisney Art Visualizer was very important for us. Um, and finally, I just want to show you one last slide, which is the future of Pixplot. So um, we've got these clusters of people skiing. We've got these clusters of like um, summer huts. We've got these clusters of strange circular uh, hidden camera images. Can we do anything more within them? Just look at them. And the answer is we really want to push Pixplot to be a tool for a curator or a scholar or an undergraduate to say, here's all the artwork from the Yale Center for British Art. All of the horses and animals have sort of ended up in this cluster. I'm going to take a lasso in a future version of Pixplot, and I'm going to draw a circle around the horses. But I'm going to like shift select and get rid of the zebra, who kind of looks like a horse, but I know isn't a horse. And then I'm going to have this curated subset of maybe 10 images. And I may can download those images, or I can bounce them into Mirador to do some comparisons through IIIF. Or maybe even I can retrain the last layer in a network to say, let me build a horse classifier for 18th century British oil painting. Um, that's some directions we want to go, and I want to acknowledge the work of the Digital Humanities Lab at Yale in helping to build this. Thank you.